Yes, welcome. This is F Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16. No, I'm not sleeping on Jersey, but shout out to the whole tri-state area in the world of Rayquan, peace Connecticut, simply because I feel like y'all don't get enough shout outs. And uh, while we talk about CT, shout out to University of Dope, who represent that lovely. And uh, today, it is all about Jersey though, because you peep the thumbnail, you peep the logo being used. We're talking about none other than the classic album by Ill Town's own Naughty by Nature, which turned 30 years old this year, 1993. All right? If you haven't already, take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel, and we're gonna get into it. This is category one, where we go over the album, the product itself. A little background on this album. It is considered the sophomore release by the group's Naughty by Nature iteration, but when they were named the New Style, they did release their debut album, Independent Leaders. Uh, and so this makes it technically the outfit's third album, but for all intents and purposes, as we're only recognizing Naughty by Nature work, this is the sophomore release. 1993 February under the Tommy Boy label and the Flavor Unit imprint. And uh, yeah, the first dimension that we go over, we're talking about the quality of the production. Now, an interesting thing with this group, we talk a lot on this channel about uh, people not being credited uh, for their production contributions, but a group decision that was made early in their careers was to just put everything in the uh, liner notes as produced by Naughty by Nature in the 90s. While we've come to know that KG is the actual producer of the group, it's not uncommon on their 90s releases when you open up and see the production is credited to the entire Naughty by Nature. You also see that sometimes with writing credits, uh, and we'll talk about that as we go into other dimensions and category too. All right, so with that said, Every last beat on this album is produced by KG with some contribution from Sidney Reynolds, SID, Sid, uh, who we talked about heavily in the Queen Latifah episode. If you haven't checked that out, go ahead and peep that. And so what you're going to get here is uh, if you read the write-ups on this album, a lot of journalists make mention of KG being sorely underrated when the talk of 90s production comes up and uh, damn near super producers uh, who are underrated and not mentioned enough if we're throwing in all the other work that he did under Ill Town Records and Divine Mill, which is his label that brought you all of these R&B acts who have hits that last to this day. You know, we're talking about everyone from John A to Next. So you're gonna hear Sid's co-production on It's On which was one of the standout singles and it samples French Spice from the jazz legend Donald Byrd, who's heavily sampled throughout hip hop in general, but they make it a point to really emphasize that horn loop that is the main crux of the beat there, right? There's a whole lead in skit talking about the collaboration with Sid and KG, you know, calling each other or visiting each other to be like, here's the sample. I'll come back to it and let you know what I do with it. Oh, here's the finished product. Listen to this, check this out. And then you hear the beat start off with that reworked horn loop and then the drums that KG adds and hits and stuff. That piano riff that's in between the notes on there is kind of signature KG stuff. It's the same piano riff style that you heard on Naughty by Nature's first hit, OPP, that it works. KG is, is a monster when it comes to picking out the right piano notes to really give an accent to beats. And so in true early 90s fashion, this is the, the last year of what's considered the early 90s period. And what's emphasized here is bass lines and drum hits. KG's real art on this album is how he splices samples. It's always, always interesting to hear different ways that producers insert elements of other songs. And KG has his own style to it. Again, referencing the Queen Latifah episode, I mentioned multiple times how KG went about splicing up the sample for the song No Work on that album. And he does a similar thing here on the song Knock Him Out the Box, 
where he samples the infamous Ike's move by Isaac Hayes. And it's just sprinkled in there. It's just the accent piece of that beat because the main beat is this hard bass line and this hard drum hit. It's also the way that he sprinkles the, the alarmy bell famous sound from Nautilus by Bob James on the Cruddy Click song. And then um, the way that the <laughs> from World Famous is used on Take It To Your Face. But more melodically and more notably, I was yesterday years old when I realized that one of the main components of the hip hop hooray beat is Make Me Say It Again, Girl, by the Isley Brothers. The same sample used famously on the Crossroads remix. And I can tell you why, because growing up, this song was one of the top five biggest hits of that year, besides Cream, Gin and Juice, and Slam. And it was just emphasized on New York radio and in the video, I believe, the bass line and the drum hits and even the Sylvia Striplin vocal sample, the boop, 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 right? Like that is more pronounced, maybe on the radio mix, maybe in the video mix, cause songs change once they get into their single iteration. Maybe it's the way the DJs played it, but it's like on the album version, I heard it more and I mentioned something similar to this when we were talking about in the Lost Boys episode, the Lex Coops, Beamers and Ben single on radio. <laughs> my young ears only remember the the bass line and the drum hit that boom, 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 and not really hearing the boom, 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 funk element in the background because it's not as emphasized in the single iteration. Or maybe it's my young ears. Y'all please tell me if y'all can relate to that, but I did not realize that this Isley Brothers sample was all throughout the song. It's what glues it together, really. Um, but again, what it sounded like to me is the way the beat sounds when Tretch says, smooth it out now, and the sample drops. And it's just a I'm not hearing all of that stuff. But when you pay attention to it, you realize how genius it is, how KG sought that out and built the beat either around it or added that to the beat he already made to accent it and make it a full song and give it just, th just that melodic twinge and familiar edge that put it over the top. And so those are the examples of like the really, really unique KG style sample usage. And then there's just some blatant open sample use, like his hip hop flip of I Can't Wait by New Shoes, the 80s classic. Uh, and there's not much done to that beat. It's just really sped up. And, you know, there's some electronic, funky worm manipulation, real 90s sounding stuff going on there. And then same thing with Sleeping on Jersey which just takes Earth, Wind & Fire, Sunshine, and just gives it a different pitch and hip hop backdrop. The original written on your kitten, same way, not as famous of a sample, but uh, same thing going on. On the less sample based or non-sample based tracks is where you hear probably the, the least creativity. Um, the intro beat, hot potato, cruddy click, it, and take it to your face or just kind of just boom back of that time, which will add to the dated quality of some of these beats. Ironically, the beats with the most blatant samples and the beats that are devoid of samples or, you know, don't really have them sound the most sealed in their time. So we listen to a beat like the beat for Ready For Them, which sounds like the dance hall that came out of the late 80s going into the early 90s. So it has a dated feel because dance hall hasn't sounded like that since. And it's not in a musical way like Sorry by Foxy Brown, where there's horns and, you know, deep bass line funk grooves you can tell was made by regular instruments. This is all like electronic made on drum machine and, and it just is you know it sounds like it's error same thing with that intro the intro is just boom, 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 
up tempo bass and and boom bap, but not in a timeless boom bap way. Boom bap of that 1993 feel. And so again, those tracks like Take It to Your Face, Cruddy Click, Hot Potato. Mostly the tracks where it's real confrontational, straight spitting, and trying to show the aggression are where the least musicality and creativity are displayed. But props need to be given to KG's genius for his ear for sampling and it's his ear for music all around. Something to sit on scale from one to five heartbeats. When you're thinking about the quality of the production on this album, that takes us to dimension two, the cohesiveness of the production on this album or the cohesiveness of the sonic bed. How does this album flow, right? Um, the intro, it's aggressive, it's stripped down. And the very last song is a rework of a track that appeared on the first album, Thanks for Sleepwalking, this is Sleepwalking 2, and it goes into a harder version, it's split with a whole nother track uh, as the outro. And so it starts off hard, it ends hard. Sleepwalking is one of the lighter songs, but because it's split with a harder beat, you could say it, it begins and ends with the same feel, right? In between there, you get a fair mix of something else that KG needs to be given his flowers for, which is his range. This is a one-man army right here, one-man band, and he's giving you everything from reggae-inspired beats to jazz-inspired beats to just straight-up hardcore boom, rumbling bass beats. With that said, your first track is 1993, uh, it goes into Hip Hop Parade, which is probably the perfect mix out of all the songs on this album of that lighter and that harder feel coming together to make a full song. Everything else is pretty binary from that point on. It's either hard or it's soft. When they go soft, they go new shoes soft. I can't wait. And they didn't harden it up and thug it out by slowing it down or emphasizing the bass. They sped it up and made it dancey. Um, sleepwalking and written on your kitten, very pop feeling. Even sleeping on Jersey, uh, the decision not to do much with that Earth, Wind & Fire sample uh, and keep the pace. I think the tempo dictates a lot of how hard or soft a, a song sounds. In the case of these major sample songs, they choose to either keep the same original tempo or speed it up and make it even more bouncy and it, and it has the effect of feeling popish, uh, even though the content is far from pop. And, and then the harder stuff is where it's a lot more slowed down. But a lot of this is to also keep a pace with Tretch's rap style. And we'll talk about that more in category two. Something I brought up a few times on the show is this idea of acts including and incorporating skits into the actual song, particularly at the beginning of the song. To do that, I feel like you are either not thinking of your listener or you are that self-assured in your creative decision that you're just like, who gonna check me, boo, right? <laughs> and so there's several songs on this album that start off with skits, none as long as the skit I talked about in the front of the song it's on, which takes up minutes, not, not just one, but uh, Daddy Was a Street Corner, same way they run it from the cops it's a long dramatic thing like that those could add some depth to the songs that that follow them or because the album's not going into any specific thematic space they could be takeaways depending on how you feel about skits and so also if we're talking about sequencing they do a decent enough job of attempting to space those types of songs out from one another, but it does wind up feeling like some of those softer tracks come more at the end of the album. Uh, it, the decision to put Written On Your Kitten right before Sleepwalking 2, and these are the final two songs on the album, which just happen to be the songs that most directly deal with uh, talking about women and dealings with women. Uh, it, it brings up that question of, bait and switch that I pose often on the show uh, after a bunch of songs that are not about that, now you get this, or, and also the idea that maybe like this is not what we want to emphasize on this album, 
the group didn't believe in these songs as strongly as they believed in the songs that came before them and so they put them at the end we'll explore more in the next dimensions for now this is something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the cohesiveness of this album the flow the sequencing all right it takes us to dimension three the intentional mood and tone on this album from a casual listening standpoint it would just seem that they were just embodying the spirit of early 90s hardcore hip hop. They were riding and floating and lost in the 1993-ness of it all, or 1993-ness of it all. But upon deeper listens to this album, you realize, oh, this is a, this is a battle album. This is an aggression. We're doubling down on the gritty, or in this case, cruddiness. And we don't want you to get it messed up just because we were Grammy nominated on our first album. And it, it almost felt like a response to the success of the first album and what created the success of that being two singles that were inspired by mega pop hits, which then made the singles become pop hits in their own right. And so it was like they went into this album like, oh, don't get it twisted. Uh, there's more songs on this album like Uptown Anthem then there are like, everything's gonna be all right in OPP. And that's exactly what happens here. There are no analogs to that. You know, I try really hard not to compare albums, but in this case, we're talking about the construction of something that feels like it was intentional in the sense of, we don't want to re recreate and replicate that kind of success. We want success in a different way. And that's what winds up happening because if you're, listening to the feel of the songs they're all hardcore in nature if not by the beats then by what's being said on the softest track on this album whichever one of those you decide is the softest Tretch is guaranteed to be talking pretty explicit the battle aspect of this album this is a beef album and it's very much so the kind of beef album like it's part of what makes this classic, but it's not one of those beef albums that's talked about for the beef. The way, uh, you know, Stillmatic and Blueprint have gone down in history because of the infamous beefs. This album is a reminder of how subliminal hip hop has historically been. Uh, we think of hip hop culture as always being this call out culture, but it's really not, man. More of your favorite rappers than not have chosen to go the route of subs and this album is full of not so subliminal subs almost half of this album is rooted in beefs and if it's not addressing beefs that existed prior to this album it's starting beefs because this is stretch and Vinny deciding hey i want to get this off my chest and call attention to this hip-hop behavior that i don't approve of you're gonna hear it in Vin Rock's verse on It's On, which is the closest you're gonna get on this album to an obvious name call, where he says, never call you sir, who gives a damn if you mix a lot? And that's only because, you know, that name is so long and it's put together with the least words between it. Tretch comes close when he says, um, I owe you, leave out the O, and your sugar free flow, that whole sequence where he's coming at Granddaddy IU, because again, as we discussed in the Queen Latifah episode, it's known that Granddaddy IU is who wrote the Big Mama song for Roxanne Shante, where she's going in on all the female rappers, and Queen Latifah is not exempt from that onslaught. And so he even goes as far as saying, if you're gonna write for somebody, make sure we don't find out. Now we know it's you and now you gotta deal with the whole flavor of the crew. And everything else is cleverly put in these like word puzzles that are not hard word puzzles. I'm just saying they're subs. I mean, he does something similar with, with Twister's name who at the time was known last as Tongue Twister. And the first diss to him on the song, The Hood Comes First, he says, you know, something about quick tongue frauds. Okay, cool. But when you get to sleeping on Jersey, he uses his name as a verb and says you can tongue twist your ass back to Chicago. So, I mean, if y'all consider that direct 
name calling, cool. But Roxanne Shantae, he's not saying her name in any way. He's saying, oh, I heard it was a horny hot chick back on the scene. And you should have known there's only one Queen Latifah. And, you know, that's going directly to her. Hide your cat. Subliminals referencing the way that she posed on the cover with the gun on that album. Um, same thing to his retorts to YZ, who there was this long standing beef from the very first album. Uh, this is Jersey beef, and this is a beef that for a long time people in the Jersey industry circles knew, but not a lot of people outside of that knew. And YZ has addressed this over time. Uh, they got kind of got kind of serious and got real tense in the streets of Jersey. But there was a diss track from YZ's associate Tony D that led to the response one, two, three on the first Naughty by Nature album. And this led to YZ dissing Naughty by Nature on Return of the Holy One, which is probably uh, one of two of his most notable songs. So in the verse two on We're the Only Ones, Tretch dedicates that whole verse to talking about the leftover Afrocentric rappers of the era, again, early 90s, was kind of where we saw the chapter close on the Afrocentric movement in hip hop. And so Trek splits that verse between addressing YZ again and addressing X Clan, specifically the elder, Professor X from X Clan, who is notorious for all of their famous catchphrases like, to the East, and this is protected by the red the black and the green. And of course, the <laughs> before all of that, oh, the signature exasperated sigh or the pondering deep breath. <laughs> and so there's a line where he says, you say you want to join the fight now, where you can, ah, oh, your ass back to Africa right now. And says the line about uh, he needs to shave from his beard to his navel because Hair under his chin looks like the gum under the table. You know, the boots and beads references, those are shared. This is to YZ, who was, you know, associated with being this knowledge based rapper, even though in Return to the Holy One, you see him waving a gun all in that video, and he's got the chainsaw, which it stated that there was this rumor that Tretch beat him up and stole that chainsaw from him in the street. Like, man, it's. It gets heavy, which, you know, YZ has gone on record saying that sounds stupid. You know, like, why would there just be a, a random chainsaw? Like, if that's the only chainsaw in existence in New Jersey. But uh, you better believe that that chainsaw choice on the cover was a statement. We'll go more into this in category two, but Tretch makes a reference to the Tower of Power song by YZ. And because the song is called The Only Ones, he ends that verse by saying, and I can't wait to see the phony one. Basically calling him out for, for just being all talk, all lip service, which is this that Jay-Z also aimed towards Nas, who for a long time in his career was credited with being this, this prophet, this street prophet, but you know wasn't known for a lot of give back, right? So, uh, or a lot of action in that direction. And so that's what he's saying. He's like, we'll be the ones to make sure the White House is painted with two coats of black. Y'all over here just talking. Um, and some of this could be attributed to Tretch was aligned with, you know, he's cool with KRS-One, who at the time had beef with X-Clan. Uh, cool with, you know, again, loyalty to Flavor Unit. You diss in Queen Latifah, I'm riding. But that seems to really, really paint a lot of the tone of this album, it's aggression. They want you to know they're cruddy. You know, when you think about how the album ends, it starts probably over the top. Like I said, very 1993 hardcore, what was considered hardcore in early 90s, effects to, to make it. So it starts with a voice like this, 1993. To, <laughs> to emphasize how serious, a lot of cursing at the beginning, and at the end, you know, when we're doing all these shout outs, KG is the last one doing shout outs. In, in a statement that probably hasn't aged well over time, it would probably be very easy to joke on right now. He's like, shout out to all the cruddy niggas. 
because I like cruddy niggas. Pause. <laughs> right? It's just like there's there's not a lot of mystery to the idea that this is what they wanted to emphasize. This is all something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the intentional mood and tone of the album. Takes it to dimension four, the song distinction versus the repetition of words and sounds. Uh, because there's a lot of bass and drum emphasized beats here, uh, you could argue there's, there's some repetition. And if you have a keener ear, there's this idea of what KG style is or his sound is but I mean you really got to be a music nerd to be like oh that's that KG sound so the the regular ear and the casual listener is just going to sound like different beats there's there's no two beats on there that sound too much alike but there is a, a feel to KG's production maybe it's because he uses similar bass lines but repetition uh is not delivered here in any obvious way now when it comes to the words being used um stretch for as many different approaches he has on the mic because there's so many songs after a while it feels like some verses are interchangeable and that you're hearing some of the same stuff because there's not a lot of different ideas being brought here. Now, the actual words being used, Tretch is a word beast. Tretch is going to make unorthodox words bend to his whim and effectively. And so you're not going to hear a lot of things repeated that he doesn't want you to hear repeated. There's some laziness in moments, like the word blown on the first verse of the hood comes first he says blown in two different ways only like one line apart from each other yeah like for no reason on cruddy click is the most aggressive and explicit song on this album it's not clear who tretch is approaching or directing his ire towards but this song has the most curse words of any song on the album in one concentrated place it even ends on a, on a super aggressive acapella note, which is really abrasive. Yeah, but that's something to consider on a scale for one to five heartbeats, how much diversity of words and sounds there are, how much song distinction there is. Takes us to dimension five, the question of content versus the amount of songs. 14 tracks, you're bound to have uh, a challenge with making sure that you achieve some kind of balance rhymes and that's exactly what seems to happen here there are not many songs that delve into any depth or any solid content uh the intro is a song it's the title track 1943 daddy was a street corner written on your kitten sleepwalking to and parts of the only ones and hip-hop parade everything else is confrontational and braggadocio so do with that what you must something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the amount of content versus the amount of songs on this album dimension six the features you have a nice rounded assortment of features here guests all courtesy of flavor unit affiliation we'll start off with the rotten rascals who are naughty by nature's first rap act under their ill town records label that they started in the mid 90s but here they started appearing this is their first appearance uh they consist of treacherous brother diesel and two other members but on the track knock them out the box it's just diesel and one other member and and they, they drive home all the symbolism and all of the intention behind the names. Rotten, cruddy, they embody that on their features here because uh, they don't sound nearly as polished as Tretch, uh, but maybe, you know, you, you get the idea that that's what they were going for. It's just that ruggedness, right? Uh, from there, you get more notable features. Another callback to a past episode, Freddie Fox. When he was simply Freddy Fox, no bumpy knuckles, but still carrying that same bite, that same 
command and presence on the mic uh, with some of the things that I, I pointed out were notable on his appearance on that Moment of Truth album. Check that episode out if you haven't. And then of course you have Queen Latifah who does a reggae inspired hook on Sleeping on Jersey. It only makes sense that she's on the track with Jersey in the title, but her presence here is really like blink and you miss it. It's an afterthought. Like you won't even really feel like anything was added by her hook. And the hook almost sounds a little rushed too. It's just very fast. It's like two bars and she's there and she's not. Interestingly enough, Heavy D, who actually is Yardy, does a reggae-inspired hook too, and he does it brilliantly, and it it flows a little bit more organically and adds a nice contrast to what they're doing rhyme-wise, because they're going in. Heavy D delivers one of his best rap performances, and it could be argued or up for debate if you believe Tretch's pin had something to do with it. I don't want to believe that because Heavy D is one of my favorite rappers of all time, one of my favorite people in hip hop. Rest in peace to Heavy D. I've never heard anything about anyone else writing his rhymes. And funny enough, Tretch's and Heavy D's go-to flow styles aren't really that far apart from each other. So it's not far-fetched to believe that Heavy just stepped it up because of who he was making the song with. You know, Tretch was, at this point in time, one of the leading rappers in the game. So it's like, oh, oh can't come lazy. But uh, I'd love to hear what you all say in the comments. These are the features on the album. Something to consider on a scale from one to five part beats, whether they hurt or help the album and how much they do takes us to the next dimension. Mention seven, the question of, do the weakest songs on the album, bring it down. As always, super subjective. Do you even believe there are weak songs on this album? I've pointed out a few things that could be considered weak, where we talk about maybe the dated quality of some tracks, uh, talked about the repetition of themes, talked about some of the features, talked about some of the softer production on some tracks. So some of you may consider Sleepwalking too, to be too soft or out of place. Same thing with the only ones, maybe the hook, maybe some of that instrumentation is annoying to you, or maybe the beats that are too stripped down to simplify with just KG emphasizing that 90s sound, hardcore, thump, didn't do it for you. Or maybe you didn't like some of the features. Maybe that Queen Latifah singing feature, reggae inspired singing feature, didn't do it. Maybe you didn't like the Rod Rascals verses or their voices. Uh, all of these things that will be considered on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the weakest song and if the weakest songs bring the album down. Dimension 8, Mass Appeal. All right, how much of a chance did this album have? We've already established that if the idea for the intentional mood and tone was to double down on how street rooted this group is and how they're not coming soft, and stop sleeping on Jersey, and we're addressing all these beefs, did it have a chance to have any commercial flourishing? Uh, history has shown, obviously it did. It's a platinum selling album, and it spawned not only one of the biggest hits of the early 90s, not only one of the biggest hits of the group's history, one of the biggest hits in hip hop history, and it just happens to have the title of hip hop in it, how fitting that we're really shining light on this moment in time on the 50th year of hip hop's history. And man, it was a monster of a single so much to the point where the other two singles did not do as well individually as the two singles from the previous album, but they had more life than they would have simply because Hip Hop Array was so big. Well, let's talk about those other two singles first, and then we'll get deeper into Hip Hop Array, right? So, Written On Your Kitten, uh, the third and final single from this album. The original version never saw the light of day commercially. When it was released to the radio and video outlets, it's the remix version, which was given an up-to-date uh, buffing by uh, QD3, 
Quincy Jones III, who we've talked about in the Tupac episodes and Westside Connection episodes, it started making his name. And I, I can go on record saying it was a much needed remix because the original version just did not have the fullness. Uh, this added a level of musicality. It went right in line with what was big on the radio. It had that West Coast G-Funk synthesizer sound that they were putting in every song. <laughs> every song you could think of, even into the R&B songs like Freak Like Me by Dina Howard. It was just, if you wanted a popular song, you had to have that. But beyond that, just the more subtle R&B-ish and, and musical feels rather than that one loop that KG was using that had nowhere to go to. It added more depth. Um, and more spaces for the, the, the song to go in. And not having that, you know, long moaning in the beginning, you know, makes it ready for listeners to, to digest. Shout out to April Walker. I think she did the styling for this video. I could be wrong, but shout out to April Walker. Uh, always walk away. And so all of that matters, right? The look, the feel, because I don't think this song was made initially with women in mind. I think this was Tretch just rapping about dealings with women from his perspective or from a guy to guy perspective. And now it's like, okay, well, let me make this more palatable for all listeners, including the female audience who is who I'm talking to and about. And that R&B feel on what they call the Q-Funk mix wound up making it more radio friendly. Uh, it's not one of the most memorable Naughty by Nature singles, which is why it was third and final, but it, it rounded it out. Final depends on what sequence you heard these songs, right? For some of you, It's On might have been the third single uh, and, or the last single that you heard. I remember this song being used in Meteor Man, the movie, the classic Robert Townsend movie. Uh, but it had already been out and popping before then. The video came out um, and, you know, they're on top of the, the roof. It was one of those songs that lasted longer on the mix shows, on the radio and video play because it was just more catchy. It was another song that's right in between that hardness that they were going for with more commercial accessibility, mostly because the hook. The hook was so catchy. Um, on and on and on, a really typical early 90s refrain, check it, check it out, to the break of dawn. All these things you're, you're, you've heard in hip hop millions of times, it works because it works. <laughs> and so, and then there's something infectious about that Donald Byrd jazz sample. I made a big deal in the Queen Latifah episode about how this was the closing era for jazz-led singles. Uh, jazz led samples in hip hop. And so this this really signifies that. So they came to do work and each of these pieces gave these songs extended life. Now, to a point I made earlier, this idea of bait and switch or believing in what you're doing, it's by the skin of teeth and, and great executive production and A&R work um, by the entire team behind Naughty by Nature picking these singles because if I had my a and hat on right now and you asked me to pick what else would be a single from this album that would work the same way we'd have slimmer pickings because this was not an album that seemed to be made with any of that in mind. How do we follow up our platinum success out the gate as one of the leading groups in hip-hop in the early 90s with another banging album that's going to generate that same success? I'm searching, I'm looking, right? It wasn't gonna be cruddy click. It wasn't gonna be knock them out the box. I don't know if Only Ones was gonna have that same rate of success as these other songs. And you're not left with many other songs that could be radio ready, club ready, video ready singles. Ready for them, since we're talking about ready, would probably be a fourth single. It had a catchy enough hook. What Heavy D added to it was big enough, and Heavy D himself was a big enough artist to take this song over the top and get it some play. Tapping into the reggae market at the time might have also given it some extended life. 
that's where it begins and ends. Everything else is just a little too hard for radio and sleeping on Jersey is a little too nuanced. Um, yeah, the softer stuff here doesn't work in the way that you set softer songs to work as because again, Tretch is not compromising his ruggedness just because the beat is softer. He's still going in. They're not going for the same <laughs> space as they were going for the first album, but it just happened to work because, you know, these are the songs that you get. If I was listening to the radio, which I was at the time, and I heard Hip Hop Hooray and Written On Your Kitten, I would think that this group is on the softer side of things and on and on is more the exception to the rule. And then you get the album and you realize it's the other way around. There's more songs on this album like It's On <laughs> and very few songs like Hip Hop Hooray are written on your kid. So know what you're getting in for. This is a hardcore album that generated some of the smoothest and what have gone on to be looked at as like happy songs. Listen closely to Hip Hop Hooray. They're just as confrontational and braggadocious as they are on any other song on the album. It just got lost in the visuals, which we have to talk about. One of the few hip hop videos directed by Spike Lee, it's always a big deal, especially in that time period. Where Spike was at his peak of fame for bringing us these event movies back to back, these 40 Acres and the Mule projects. So for him to take time away from his steady stream of yearly releases to do a rap video, and, and this is bigger than when he did Scenario for Tribal Quest, because now he's Spike, he's the Spike that gave us Malcolm X, uh, Oscar nominated Malcolm X, right? So him coming out, he's doing this video, and yes, it's a junkyard, backdrop like most early 90s videos but it's a junkyard backdrop without the dark angles without the beat down scenes it's people with babies it's people doing dance moves they got bats but they're dancing with the bats <laughs> and it just seemed like a good time and of course the famous 90 dance which is always my go-to if you put joints like this on uh it just felt like a good time and that adds to this idea that Naughty is not as naughty, perhaps, right? Written on your kidneys on fire escapes, he's wearing white, there's bowls of milk, there's sexy women. You're not thinking that this is the crew that runs around with machetes, chainsaws, bicycle chains, and is, you know, going at like five to six rappers on this album. So contrary to what the Sprite ad campaigns were saying around this time, Thirst is nothing, image is king, perception is everything. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the mass appeal of this album that takes us directly into the three eyes, impact, innovation, influence. Oh my. It, you can't talk about this album without talking about Hip Hop Hooray. Hip Hop Hooray was an event, it was a movement, it was a moment in time and it capped off 1993 uh, so perfectly. When we think about the closing of the early 90s era, this was an anthem. This is what kind of branded Naughty by Nature as being the group that creates anthems. And I think in later albums, they tried hard to live up to that. You'll hear Tretch utilize the word anthem throughout the career later on uh, in the 90s. And you know hip hop songs get big when Older people know them, and people outside the immediate hip hop culture know them. This was that song. You've seen elements of this song appear in movies like Sister Act 2, where in the classroom scene, and the guy's like, call me Frank, hey, ho, and then they start doing that, like, it was that big. All the elders knew the song, everybody was doing the, the crowd movement. This was Swag Surf before Swag Surf. This was huge. Monumental, like I said, the visuals added a lot to it. This was coming up on MTV compilations. This was used as the Yo MTV Raps background station identification music for a minute. More people will know Naughty from this song than they will know them from any other song. And it felt right in line with what they were doing. There's nothing out of place 
about this song, but that's the impact. And it's and it's funny that such a beef ridden album, that part is not talked about that much. That's not its legacy. Its legacy is uh, helping Naughty avoid the sophomore jinx, helping them have just as many hits as they had on the first album without compromising or trying to re replicate that formula. And they did it successfully. So they have bragging rights to be able to say, nope, we didn't try to do the same thing twice. Um, and you can say the same thing about the third album. They were not trying to repeat formulas until after the 90s were over. And so the influence, I heard Eminem go on record talking about how Tretch is sorely and severely overlooked when it comes to great rappers, greatest rappers of all time. And I have to agree, what Tretch has done on the microphone, especially what he showcases here, because this is a more up-to-date version of the style he introduced on the first album, and he got better, you know, each time with commanding his 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 particular brand and wedging out his particular space in hip hop. And he was very serious about this on this album. We'll talk about it in category two. He's very protective of his style because he knew that his style was very unique to him. There was no one rapping like Tretch on a commercial level before Tretch. And there have been very few after him. When I did the West Side Connection episode, I talked about Dub C having pieces that sound reminiscent in his delivery, but you can tell it's not derivative of Tretch. It's just they cut from the same cloth, um, which is ironic because there's a line on here where Tretch says something about you get caught by the mad circle. Anyway, it's the closest I've heard anybody come to it. Somehow Tretch escaped being associated with the fast rap. Um, he might have been lumped in with the Iggy rappers, but I don't think he's the first name that comes to mind when you think about the Iggy uh, trend. And he just kind of stands alone because he's he wasn't a speed rapper, even though he rapped with a lot of speed. Innovation-wise, I think this is another thing that speaks to that inner Jersey industry stuff. I think Jersey folks felt the impact and what this brought to the industry from a Jersey perspective uh, more than anyone else. I don't think this garnered any new feelings because again, at this point, Naughty by Nature was bigger than where they were from. They were one of the top three groups in hip hop, if not the leading group at this point. And it, no one was thinking about Ill Town. A lot of us didn't even know where Ill Town was unless you were from Jersey. We didn't know all the nicknames, Chill Town, Ill Town, the Brick City. Like, listen, Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, Harlem. <laughs> now, now Shaolin added to the fray because Wu-Tang came out this year. Now you want us to know the names of all these cities in another state? Oh man. But I think with Jersey Pride, they innovated a lot of things because they, they were carrying flag for a while. In hindsight, you realize how much came from this album, uh, even punchline wise. So all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five when you're thinking about the three eyes, impact, innovation, influence. Dimension 10, overall uniqueness and timelessness of this album. I started off by saying it's the perfect title for an album because it sounds like a dedication to that year. 1993 sounds like 1993. In its purest, rawest essence. The beats, what was being rapped about, and even some of the, the hooks and cadences, it's, it's there. It does have a dated quality and that affects some of its replay value. I would find it hard to believe that many folks would be able to bump this from front to back without a nostalgia element attached. Those of you who can are probably deeply entrenched in the feels and memories associated with that time in life, that time in hip hop, and where you were at and what was going on. Other than that, if I were to introduce this to a new hip hop listener, I think there are a lot of things on there that would be ineffective or, or even turn offish because of how much of its era it sounded like. I think of that Queen Latifah book. I think of 
the stripped down beats without the melodic and sampled elements. I think about some of the slang that was being used. But because of that point that I just got through making of Tretch sounding so different and not having many people in hip hop history who have sound like him, the uniqueness balances that out. So where it's dated to, a, to an extent and maybe not so timeless, it's very unique. Um, and it's unique in what it accomplished as well, commercially. So all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. And that concludes the category one breakdown and review of the classic 1993 by Jersey Zone, Naughty by Nature. Join me for the next episode where we go over category two, the rap performance on this album. And until next time, y'all know what it is. F a rap critic, they talk about it while I live it. Words and meth.